this has got to be this prime minister. Uh, let me tell you, I have now worked with him now for six years. My God, he listened. And by the way, if there's anybody who actually will change his mind, if you give him evidence that whatever his preconceived view is, uh, needs to be changed because this is what the evidence is, uh, he changes his mind. Any of you have ever been to the US, you will find that they have terrible domestic airline. I mean, even the worst Indian airline uh, is better than their best. Why does this happen? Because they don't allow this creative destruction thing to happen. Mm. Whereas we are allowing this creative destruction to happen. Good guys are coming, bad guys are going. ILO has gone and done this uh, study or WHO know what they are doing. But a lot of it this is just garbage. Mm. They made it up because they want to manipulate you in some way. And many of these international organizations deliberately do this. We've created so many episodes on geopolitics. People have come on the podcast and expressed their opinions. People have expressed their opinions on PM Modi, the current government, the future of India. Sometimes these opinions have been negative. So many people express themselves on YouTube, on social media. And I also strongly believe that most strong opinions are backed by loose information, usually. Not in all cases. In some cases, they're extremely well-researched, extremely well-thought-out. They take into account the other side of the argument as well. And whether you're a pro-Modi listener of the show or an anti-Modi listener of the show, if you're an Indian, if you care about where India is going, or if you simply care about the subject of economics, this is the episode for you. Sanjeev Sanyal works directly with the PM of our country. He's a part of the PM office as an economic advisor for the future of our nation. People like him decide where our nation goes five years from now, 10 years from now, especially when it comes to money, especially when it comes to the growth of our country. This is the kind of conversation you want to listen to before forming opinions about the Modi government or governments in general or what's happening in the world generally. I'm not going to speak too much anymore. I will let you slip into this economic special of the Renvi show. Remember, if the conversation gets extremely heavy for you, scan TRS Clips, our YouTube highlights channel, where we only upload highlights of each episode. It will help you sit through the different sections of this episode. If you want to increase your attention span though, you better start meditating. My meditation app level is now live on the App Store and the Play Store. Go check it out. And finally, all I'll say is follow us on Spotify because a lot more conversations like this are coming up very soon. We're a Spotify exclusive. Every episode's available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. This is Sanjeev Sanyal on The Ranbir Show. Sanjeev Sanyal, welcome to the Ranveer Show. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Uh, you just told me not to get intimidated by you before we began shooting. I want to know why you said that. No, no, people are way too deferential, sir, 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 etc. in these kinds of things. So I said, please don't be deferential. Uh, honestly, you're one of the widest spectrum of personalities. Like you have one of the uh, most elaborate kind of knowledge sets. Hmm. So before this episode, I was actually figuring, okay, should I talk to you about your family's history? Should I talk to you about economics? Should I talk to you about your day-to-day -day life? I don't know what I should talk to you about. But in saying that, we've never done an economic-centric episode on the show. So I think that's why we'll dive deeper. Uh, how do you explain economics to a four-year-old? Well, it's about, uh, no, a four-year-old may be a bit too young. Okay. But I think somewhere around about 10-year-old, I could explain sure. it. That look... Uh, there is a limited amount of resources on this planet. Um, and how do you make sure that it gets used in a way that makes as many people as possible uh, prosperous and that we can all have a good life and uh, incorporate new technologies and make progress? Okay. So how do you arrange all of that is what economics is about. Okay. Uh, what do you mean by resources? Resources means, you know, there's only so much... Um, food to eat, there's only so much industrial production, uh, there's natural resources of various kinds, you know, minerals, water, etc. So how do you make sure that you take all these resources um, and make sure that they are distributed in the best possible way? And so part of it can be done by government, part of it can be done by uh, markets, 
uh, and so on and so forth. And how this arrangement works is economics. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, what's a day in your life like? Like, r- what do you do right now for people who have no clue about what you do specifically with the government? Can you explain your job to them? Sure. Uh, I am an economic advisor to uh, Prime Minister Modi. So, um, well, obviously that requ- that's about providing economic advice to how to, as I said, run the economy and so on. Uh, but since you asked about how my day works, let me say there is no pattern at all in it uh, because I travel quite a lot. Right now I'm in Mumbai, but I live in Delhi. Um, I, you know, next week I am in uh, New York for a conference in Columbia University. So there's a lot of traveling. Uh, then, as you can imagine, this is a job which is very prone to crises of various kinds. So, you know, you have COVID shock. So suddenly there's a lot of work related to that, which you'd never imagined. You sort of got swayed off into a different direction. Um, then there is G20 and these kinds of things that turn up. So it's very choppy. Um, mm. You know, there will be days when I really work very hard and then there are times where hopefully a little bit slower. Okay. And so, uh, and in the middle of all that, I'm attempting to write a book and do other things as well. So uh, I'm one of those people who, uh, uh, you have to be very disciplined with this because you have to keep things moving without there being any pattern in your otherwise uh, in the life. So it's not like, you know, some people say, I like writing a book at, uh, I have two hours designated every day to write. Mm. I have no such thing. I mean, all my books have been written the chapters have been written, you know, in one big, you know, one long weekend I got free and I wrote one whole chapter mm. in that. Like I worked 16 hours, three days flat and finished the chapter. Because that's literally the only way I can do it. How did you get to this point of actually becoming an advisor for the government? Like you you would have definitely studied a lot, done a lot. And then I'm assuming you would have been cherry picked in some form. Uh, well, um, so I uh, so I, I studied economics first at uh, Delhi University, then at Oxford University. Uh, then I became a financial markets guy for about 22 years. So I uh, I was an economist. So I'm not when I'm saying I'm working in financial markets. I don't mean that I'm uh, uh, I'm a mainline guy who gives out loans or something like that. No, I'm not a banker in that sense. I was an economist, and my job was really to just uh, look at how interest rates are moving, exchange rates were moving. Uh, credit, uh, sovereign credit risk, uh, equity markets, liquidity, things like that. You'll have to explain what these things mean to like school going audiences. Fine. Not, not, you know about the share market? Yeah. You know about exchange rate, rupee yes. dollar rates, etc. Yes. So my job was try and guess, uh, roughly speaking, what's happening in these markets and essentially help uh, uh, my team to make bets on that. Okay. So... Uh, uh, the other word for it is basically calculated speculation. Hmm. You can call it that, whatever you want. Yeah. So you, you basically knew a lot about finance. You had studied it all your life, and you were in a position to be able to predict. Yeah. So the I worked for future. Europe's largest bank, which is Deutsche Bank. Okay. Uh, till about tw- end of twenty fifteen, and so this was my job. So looking at global markets, and not India. I was I was looking at markets around the world, and basically uh, managing investments, risks, uncertainty, and you know trying. Trying to basically make sure that, um, you know, our our banks, clients and ourselves were able to make money in this and manage the risks. All kinds of shocks keep happening. You know what's happening in financial markets right now. Banks in the US are failing. Uh, Credit Suisse is under stress and so on. So these kinds of things happen all the time. So my job was to kind of keep keep up with all of this. Um, And so that's what I did till 2015 end. So you had to study for a living in many ways. Yes, I had to study for a living. But it's not academic studying in that sense. After all, the academic training, a lot of it is really being imaginative because unlike an academic where you can go and say something and there's not very much skin in the game, here things would blow up if you got it wrong. Mm. So, uh, you know, you burn your fingers a few times and after that, you have a lot of respect for markets uh, because they can do things that you can't imagine suddenly happen. So uh, that's what I did till 2015. Then, uh, um, you know, I was sounded out to by uh, uh, the political leadership, uh, whether I uh, was willing to come over and work in the government. And so uh, I said, yes. So in the very beginning. But of, one, one second, yes. you're, being, you're being humble here. I want to ask you why you and why not other people in your position? Like in any field, uh, there are relatively few uh, eligible people, so to speak. In any field, that is the case. So if, you, if, if you're looking for uh, you know, music director, there's, you know, there'll be a relatively small group of 10, 15 people. 
uh, if you want to do uh, you know design i don't know chips or something in that world there'll be in the world maybe 10 15 people so similarly macro economists uh, in the world who have some track record etc isn't a very large universe uh, you know there is a bunch of people like uh, kv subramaniam my col- former colleague or raguram rajan who was the governor if you add a bunch of these th- people like that bebek debroy who is my colleague again right now in the prime minister's economic council so you end up with macro economists economists in uh, 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 of some standing it comes to 15 people so i happen to be one of those people and this is mm-hmm. why people get intimidated by you sir <laughs> this is the whole intimidation angle not not that <laughs> we're getting intimidated i'm trying to get to your human side okay but but uh, let's go on now i'll let you continue the story yeah so then you know so if you're one of those for whatever reason they decide that maybe he he might be willing to come and work in the government uh, not everybody agrees uh, uh, so i i did because it's a high pressure job i'm assuming it's a high pressure job some people may have other preferences um, okay. uh, working in financial markets for example is uh, financially a lot more lucrative than it is for working in the government for mm. example uh, and so on and so forth so there may be a multiple reasons why people may not want to take it up okay. so it's a small pool and not everybody else everybody wants to uh, work in the government people may have ideological or political differences that's another reason they may not want to mm. work with a particular government they may be willing to work with another government so there are many reasons do you do you have political ambition no i am not i am a technocrat uh, oh. in that sense i mean obviously i have ideological views mm. uh, but by and large i am an administrator uh, okay. uh, of things so yeah so that's how in uh, early uh, in february of uh, 2017 i ended up working in the government but that time i did a slightly a somewhat different job i joined the government as principal economic advisor to the fi- uh, to the finance minister at that time so i was working in the finance ministry and i worked for 5 years uh, there as the principal economic advisor uh, so some of your viewers may be familiar with something called the economic survey so i was one of the principal authors of that economic survey that comes out every year so that's what i did and of course uh, there and, were... and for people who are not familiar you'll have to explain what okay it is. so the economic survey is published every year just before the budget on the day before the budget uh, those of you uh, who uh, viewers who have uh, who have been uh, you know prepared for the upsc or uh, studied economics in university and so on will be familiar with this document comes out every year uh, it is possibly the most widely read uh, document written by the indian government mm. and uh, for the five years that i was the principal economic advisor i was one of its uh, uh, main authors uh, and after doing that till uh, the um, uh, the uh, budget or economic survey of uh, 2022 uh, i then shifted to the new team as part of uh, the prime minister's economic advisory council where i am now okay uh you know i get that you were in a different department but in my eyes it kind of seems like a similar job like in yeah, terms of yeah it is a similar the, job it is a similar job what what you were doing with the finance minister and now with the pm yes so what is th- there is some difference i'll tell you uh that job principal economic advisor is a little more operational in the sense that i have to be think about let's say the monthly gst collections and so things like that uh here it's much more strategic because you're working with in a in the prime minister's office so you're thinking about things like uh, even though i used to work for about g20 but i'll think about it more here mm. uh, or i'll think about things which may not be purely economics as well so here because that is more uh, vertical this is more horizontal gotcha so one of the things i've worked on recently which may seem appear to have nothing to do with economics is a report on Uh, looking uh, relooking at uh, the list of national uh, nationally protected monuments so india has some 3700 odd nationally protected monuments um and relooking at the list to see whether that's a sensible list or not i published a report on this a month ago now this would not be something i would have done if i was the principal economic advisor but here because i am in the prime i am the prime minister's economic advisor which is a more flat across uh, cross cutting uh, job Uh, this is something that uh, you know i um, would do okay uh heavy job profile <laughs> this there's a lot to dig like you've already given me like 30 questions to ask you uh this doesn't happen to me at this point in the podcast but let's dive straight in let's dive straight in <laughs> okay um i want to ask you to begin with uh 
what's it actually like working in the PM's office on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, what I have understood from the show, from diplomats, from anyone who's even kind of worked with the government, uh, I figured that PM Modi is extremely busy. He has almost no time to spare. He's always running around. And I'm assuming that that's the case with his entire office as well. So, on a very human level, how intense is it really? And second question is, what's a day in the life like there? Always new things to fight. But then where is the room for creativity where you can think of like how to run the nation a year from now or two years from now, 10 years from now? So obviously there is one core team in the PMO that yeah. is dealing with the day-to-day -day issues. And they are dealing with the ministries where also. So in that sense, it's a boiler room where all kinds of things are going on. And I participate in it too. But the role I have is exactly what you said, thinking about the somewhat uh, longer term. Mm. That's why I get time to be able to, relatively speaking to the others, do more research, uh, pick up a topic and write, say, a working paper. And I keep publishing working papers. As What's a working paper? Working paper is like a, a slightly more formal thought through paper on an issue, like okay. just you said. Like it could be on, let's say, uh, randomly picking up a working paper I've done in the last few months. Uh, you pick up the patents office. Okay, the patenting is about all about intellectual property rights and all of this thing. And so I wrote a paper saying why India's patenting system should be three, four times larger than uh, it is today. So you make the case why why do we need the patenting system? Why does it need to be four times as as large? Uh, how much money would it take? How many people need to be hired? So that is not day to day fighting. This is more strategic kind of thinking. So this is the sort of thing that I have the luxury of doing that maybe many other people working uh, for the prime minister may not have that luxury. So I get that luxury. <laughs> the creative aspect, like yeah, building it's, the yeah, future. It's a little bit of space, but okay. somebody has to do it. So okay. here I am. So technically, you are responsible for the criticism or appreciation that the government will get a year from now or two years from now, at least in some capacity. Yeah, some capacity. Obviously, a lot of it depends on uh, implementation, uh, a lot of, I mean, it's not like just because I said something, it gets done. I mean, many people may disagree. The Prime Minister himself may disagree. So, uh, so not that every idea I have finds fruition. But yes, to the extent that they do, uh, okay. uh, yeah, I deserve the criticism or credit, whichever way you okay. want to put it. So when uh, trolls say, Achhe din gaye, it's actually directed at you. Yeah, of course. Okay. We take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, do you, are you guys, are you guys aware of like, you know, online trolling or all that? that I mean, I'm sure. Of course, not. I get trolled all the time on Twitter. Anybody who's on Twitter gets trolled all the time. There yeah. are a whole bunch of people. You know, if I say the sun rises in the east, they'll say, Hacha? Mm. How do you know? Mm. Ye hi din hai. Mm. <laughs> cool. What else are you used to reading on Twitter? Uh, all kinds of things. I mean, by the way, I have another life as a historian. So, um, you know, there are a whole bunch of people that say, uh, why is The Economist writing history books? So, aise bhi log hain. <laughs> then there are people, no matter what I say, as I said, even if I say the sun rose of the east, they will criticize eh, all kinds of things. If you, look, if, you're, if you open yourself up on social media, you should be willing to uh, get trolled all the time. And then there are people who are who are, you can see that there has a fake account that has been created for the express purpose of trolling you. So mm. it's okay. It's part of the game. Yeah. I'm going to ask you what PM Modi is like to work with and what do people not understand about him as a person? So uh, I think, uh, you know, people have this view that he has this preset view of the world and he rams it through. Mm. Absolutely not true. Uh, if there is anybody who is a good listener, this has got to be this prime minister. Uh, let me tell you, I have now worked with him now for six years. Uh, first as prime minister, uh, uh, as principal economic advisor, and now directly as part of his economic advisory team. I have been in meetings with other people there, and I have been in many one-to-one -one meetings with him. My God, he listens. And by the way, if there's anybody who actually will change his mind, if you give him evidence that whatever his preconceived view is, uh, needs to be changed because this is what the evidence is, uh, he changes his mind. And that, I believe, is the greatest trait of a leader. That when presented evidence, contrary to his whatever may be his preconceived idea, he changes his view. And I think that is an amazing trait. Uh, so the ability to listen um, is, I would say, his biggest strength. Okay. And that's usually where growth as a leader stops, right? Like the moment you kind of stop taking feedback or you stop listening. Absolutely. 
Okay. So Prime Minister Modi is all about feedback loops. Mm. It, it is it, uh, those who work closely with him, all of them will tell you he is an unbelievable listener. Okay. Um the reason I'm asking about PM mm. Modi and we're talking about self criticism mm. is uh because I want to ask you mm. if you think that he considers his whole term exactly how he wanted it to go. So when he became prime minister for the first time, he must have had certain visions of like how he wants to govern the country. Do you think he looks back at it as like perfection or he feels that no this this could have been improved that could have been improved. I think I think he'll always think the because first of all he's a person who's always being driven. So no matter what his vision was in the beginning, I mean I I only have a general view. I don't can't look inside his head, but I would say that the nature of the job is such that you are being hit by all kinds of shocks all the time i mean covid is one shock then ukraine war comes along some now global financial crisis is happening turn or may or may not happen but looks like something is brewing so in you are navigating this ship through very very stormy waters and it's a very complicated large ship where you, you could barely tell where the front is and the back is so in this really stormy messy situation the job is not to aim for perfection you can't uh, no leader of any major economy in the world will be able to do that because But something is going to go something's wrong. going wrong all the time that is the nature of it you know uh, and this is just in the administration of the economy there's also you know elections are happening he's losing and winning in state elections then in the middle of it el nino effect will happen and drought may happen all kinds of natural disasters earthquakes So you are dealing with an extremely chaotic universe. So there is there is no sense of thinking about any rigid perfectionist uh, idea. The question is: Are you able to navigate through this and get the things, big things that you want to do done? So, for example, one of the big things he wants to get done is in uh, physical infrastructure, roads, airports, etc. So, throughout the COVID thing, despite all the disruptions, you see infrastructure kept getting built. Mm. So why? Because you see, basically, you keep it going. Now, some of it may also go wrong. I mean, the you know, uh, you know, you may end up building an airport somebody somewhere, and it turns out that it's not going to have the traffic you uh, forecast or whatever. Those things will at the edge. Things are always going off. But it's a question of managing the whole thing, uh, believing in your team, empowering them, and uh, providing leadership when things go wrong. That is actually the biggest and most complicated thing. you know you can always have technocrats telling you what to do see i can also have views and i do have views on how the economy should be run etc in the end uh, i am not the person who takes the political flack when things are going wrong so somebody like prime minister modi is ultimately a leader not just because he is doing what he is doing but he is also in some sense the person who will be blamed if it goes wrong and he still has to provide leadership through through all of that so he is the person who is taking the risk not me yeah, i think mentally you have to be built like a bull to be able to absolutely be, this is really uh, yeah this is about uh, character in the end i've often wondered why someone would willingly sign up for a job in politics especially with those kind of political ambitions uh i'm sure power is like kind of seductive but Do you really want this kind of a life where it's so intense and you are going to trade off your mental health repeatedly? It's a tough job. I'm being a politician. Let me tell you, is a, is a very tough job. I mean, irrespective of uh, ideology or anything, uh, party, etc. Uh, being a politician is a twenty four seven and very tough job. Even if you're a local MLA in in some state with uh, you know whatever. uh it's tough you know <laughs> your local uh, constituents will turn up at your door you know mere bet uh, your son needs a job uh, sa- uh daughter has broken her leg and you are expected to respond in some fashion uh it's uh, very difficult and of course uh, it's true worldwide but certainly in india there are no boundaries people don't uh, i mean i have seen politician friends of mine and we are sitting uh, for dinner on a f- uh, saturday night after many attempts we finally get to meet <laughs> and suddenly in the middle of all of that phone call comes from back in his constituency somewhere deep inside some uh, person's car has broken down in some village in his constituency and he thinks that his member of parliament should do something about it mm. you know so there are all this stuff that goes on so you know and uh, at some level he has to respond because come election time that same person 
he expects him to go out canvassing votes for him mm. so it's not like it's a one way relationship so so this is a very difficult job being a politician uh, i have to say toughest job in the world okay very raw question for you okay mm. most people from my generation are probably even say your generation mm. and then even my parents's generation which is older than you mm. have now really begun to watch youtube in order to understand what's happening in the world yeah. and especially the country uh is the government aware of channels that criticize them as well yeah yeah okay i can assure you as i said if you're on social media there are enough people tagging you on them okay. <laughs> so okay. yeah yeah we watch them and it's good good feedback is important okay some of it is honest feedback some of it is ideologically or politically driven feedback so but then that's the filter you have to uh, how do use. you how do you uh, filter it no so you have to take a judgment call and uh, after a while also you know the personality there's some people who will criticize you even if you you know did something genuinely good and they even agree with it Uh, and in fact they were themselves advocating those things uh if you do it then they'll criticize you so you just filter those out okay. but then there are people who give uh, genuine feedback and we take it all the time uh, okay. uh, i mean by the way youtube is only one source there's mainstream media still is a part of that how important so is it now because honestly the on ground truth is that few and few people are watching the news and even news journalists feel so no no so that may be the case <clears throat> but you see uh, some of the stuff on the youtube still comes from mainstream media by the way even yeah. if if uh, somebody may be commenting on it and pulling material but mainstream media does still provide the uh, sort of the base on which many of these discussions happen okay so it is not the case that they have become irrelevant secondly uh, are they uh, i don't think they are irrelevant but they have needed to have changed and they have changed to some extent Uh, and they are also evolving by the way yeah. just like everybody else they are also making their way through uh, the world and new platforms are popping up as well all the time uh, including yours but uh, there are other platforms as well like ani ha- yeah. has got uh, uh, smita has uh, prakash has got her Fantastic own show, uh, show. Uh, you are doing one uh, then arnab has his own style for debating style <sighs> so there is a whole mix of stuff that's going on okay. um and and at every point in time there are different markets right there are different people getting information on different subjects from different ways so there's no one way it's it's a it's not like the old days you picked up the newspaper sat in your balcony sip tea and got your information from that newspaper mm. the, you are being bombarded with you know uh, your alumni uh, uh, groups uh, Uh, whatsapp is also a source of information debates are happening there also people are giving some of it is rubbish some of it is good uh, so i think we have all become much better at uh, filtering garbage or being able to tell what is true and not true than we were say 5 years ago where mm. any and every whatsapp um, forward was seen as gospel truth i think most people uh, are now a little bit more skeptical of anything that turns up in their whatsapp group um but on the other hand some of it is fun uh, and some of it goes around some of it is conspiracy theories conspiracy mm. theories are also fun by the way i'm not <laughs> saying i don't my i don't i don't dislike uh, watching them <laughs> you know aliens are landing and all that kind of thing but fact of the matter is you also have to got to take up with you know with many pinches of salt yeah. so you know you get feedback of all kinds of okay. kinds and some of it then you have to filter and that's the job so because you're with the government sir hmm. does india have an area 51 version of itself Uh, I can't tell you. If okay. I had to, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Or take out a flashlight and then erase my memory. Yeah. Uh, I'm kidding. What I do wish to ask you though is, what's up with the government? What are you guys thinking about in terms of the future of the country? And I'm going to give you a very rudimentary angle based on what I have learned through the podcast. Okay. Um, the general consensus. after speaking to like all the indians uh, that i've had on the show is that everyone feels like the current government is the government that should be there considering the world's current scenario and the world is honestly in geopolitical turmoil suddenly uh, they say that there's decades where nothing happens and then there's months where decades worth of things happen all together and i feel that the last few years have been a series of months like that where too much has happened now in the present day scenario we feel that the current government is exactly the government that should be there that's the general consensus of course you have your uh, people who don't agree with this okay which is primarily urban elite that's hmm. honestly yeah, what yeah that's is. true and as a media professional as a podcast i'm not a journalist i'm not educated to be a journalist 
but as a media professional i feel that if i am in this position of extracting information from people like yourself who are working with the government extracting information from people maybe who criticize the government i need to stay as centrist as possible irrespective of what i am emotionally or what i am as a human but i also feel even that side is pretty much centrist now for the sake of my job because i think it's the ethical thing to do hmm. uh what i have understood geopolitically is that uh, when a country basically grows economically when we become richer you also become geopolitically more powerful yeah because our media and whatever our country's history is has already kind of done the job for soft power mm-hmm. but when it comes to hard power it's about money at the end of the day mm-hmm. and if we study success stories mm-hmm. like china first they became rich then they mm-hmm. became powerful now please correct me if i'm wrong so there's two ways to become rich one is if you have resources like minerals in the within the country and the government finds it and we start mining and uh, you know exports increase and we make money through that i i know how rudimentary this is and by the way that is a dangerous way because very often the large powers of the time will take an inordinate uh, interest in your existence as iraq found out for example mm. <laughs> so uh trying to become rich on the basis of natural resources is a uh, Really? It is a dangerous game. Okay. Uh so I I would say that ultimately the strength of an economy is based on having a much more widely based okay. uh, system. Obviously depends on the size of the country and yeah. so on. Yeah. Uh see you know when there's people like you in front of me I get embarrassed to even talk so much but it's my job as a podcaster to just give you youth context. <laughs> okay. Uh the other angle is um is it true that if we have many more entrepreneurs in our country and many more businesses in the country it will directly impact the economy and make the country rich? Absolutely. So is the goal of the government to kind of sprout out a horde of new entrepreneurs? Absolutely. Okay. So let it be absolutely clear and this is not what I am just saying this is what finance minister uh, Nirmala Sitharaman ji says this is what prime minister uh, Modi ji also is saying uh, and many other senior members of the government are saying so is the following we the government's job is not to be running businesses our job is to create a climate which is stable enough in terms of inflation being under control or uh, the financial system being uh, reasonably regulated and also to provide you with the infrastructure the physical infrastructure the roads the airports etc to be able to do your own thing so it's about ease of living it's about ease of doing business and so on so basically make your life as easy as possible so that the next generation of entrepreneurs innovators thinkers etc can go and do their own thing without having to uh, think about uh, you know then these nitty gritties yeah. so this is the broad idea it is getting easier this i'm speaking as an entrepreneur having mm. done multiple businesses yeah. it's progressively gotten easier over the years Th- then good that's great feedback because this is what we are trying to do okay so our job is to try and make it easier now i'm not saying that we're getting it right every time and there will be places where we are trying to help you but actually we are not all kinds of things may be happening all the time and something may help one bunch of people may make it difficult for another bunch of people so we are making trade offs all the time but the idea here is not that the the uh, government is should be in the business of doing government except where there is a market failure for some reason entrepreneurship doesn't sprout up in that area or doesn't deliver the goods then yes there is to be a government intervention but otherwise we believe that the energy of this of india has to come bottom up it is not top down and our job is to create the space so let me since i'm not a big cricket fan but most many indians understand cricket <laughs> so i will explain it in cricket terms the government is bcci okay it is a job of bcci to uh, uh, create the match organize the match make sure the field is there the uh, that the tv rights have been sold the tickets have been sold uh, uh two umpires have been sent there to make sure but it is not the job of bcci to play the match it is the job of the players to play the match the entrepreneurs and the workforce absolutely so our job is to make sure here are the rules here is the field here is the here are two umpires but the actual match is played by the the players so the same way in the economy the job of the government is to create the infrastructure organize for regulators etc which is the umpires create the set of rules and then the players are the workers the entrepreneurs the uh, all the other uh, professionals uh, all, basically the entire farmers okay. whoever is okay. there again after a lot of probing on this mm. show i figured that education is actually the goal when you're talking about bottom up no that's, that's also one part of it you can you cannot think of any one of these things separately education is also important uh, but health is also important okay so is um, um, you know making highways so 
Uh, so, so there's all kinds of trade-offs that have to be made. So one even, without the other is meaningless. Even the health and the highways actually come from money, which then comes from the workforce. Which probably arises from education. Yes and no. What I'm trying to say is that is a very linear view. In fact, that is the, a, a bad view of thinking about oh, things. Oh, correct so, me. Yeah. So you see, all of these things feed on each other. The world is a complex place. Okay. So if you just if you just invest in one thing, you will not be able to. For example, um, you know, Cuba is a country that invests well in health. Okay. Okay. Uh, it has a decent health system for some many decades now. Uh, but it's not a successful country in any other field. So if you have a very uh, uh, sort of unilateral. unilateral view, then you will not end up being a successful country. So we have to create, you know, uh, the an economy is like an e ecological system, right? So if you only have tigers, then the tiger will starve if there are no deer. Mm. And the deer will starve if there are no trees. The tree will not grow if there are no uh, no bees. Or, or, uh, and so on, yeah. you know. If you teach a kid only how to bat, he can't become a cricketer. Hmm. Same logic. Same okay. logic. So you, ha you cannot just invest in one thing. And in fact, going back to your very first question, which was about what is economics? This is what economics is about. It's about these trade-offs. Mm. And of course, every little bit thinks that they are the most important thing. Going. So the mm. academics think education is the only important thing. The doctors think health is the only important thing. Uh, the uh, uh, um, airlines think uh, civil aviation is the only important thing. Capitalists uh, think money. Uh, every, is everybody the... thinks mm. something. Bankers think the money is the only important thing. But in fact, all of them are important. And the game is about balancing their requirements and keeping the thing going. Damn. Okay. Um, one of the protocols about the show that I didn't tell you, huh. uh, I, I don't know why I Surprise. forgot to tell you this, <laughs> was that uh, I encourage you to disagree with me and correct me on points. Because okay. uh, the goal of this podcast for me uh, is, and for the yeah. audience is to yeah. like learn better through yeah, fair enough. being schooled. So yeah. School me, sir. Uh, so, so you now understood what we are trying to do. So now yeah. the thing is, if it's about balancing all of, all of these different uses, how oh. do you go about it, okay? So one way is to have a bunch of wise men sitting in something called planning commission telling you how this whole thing is supposed to be run. This was the mindset that we had before 1991 reforms. That there were all these wise men sitting in planning commission in Delhi who could plan the economy. So that is why that was the socialist system. A more strong version of that was done in the Soviet Union. Um, where you know the communist party decided whatever how everybody ate slept did everything else so that's one way of doing it the other way of doing it is allowing a mixture of things and yet another way is that allow purely the markets to decide so whoever has the money decides now the way we think about it is here is that we we got rid of the planning commission precisely because we came to the conclusion that there were no such thing as wise men who knew everything about everything so Planning Commission was shut, uh, shut down. It was set up with a somewhat different uh, institution called Niti Aayog, which is a policy think tank. Now what happens is we allow basically the economy to generate various ideas, entrepreneurship, etc. And the market by and large decides how things will evolve. What and the you, government... What, what do you mean by that? that by sentence. that, it may mean supposing uh, you have a whole, whole bunch of people, they decide that, look, I can uh, create the next... Uh, big thing in smartphones. So five different companies, entrepreneurs try to create different kinds of smartphones. Now some succeed, some fail. That is decided by whom? That is decided by the market, i.e. by consumers mm. deciding what is good and bad. Now, that doesn't mean the government has no role in this. The government still has to auction airwaves and other things. It may have to provide some supporting infrastructure in some areas and so on. So there is a role for government in this, but it is not to go out there and design the cell phone. So this is why uh, systems that are allowed for this to happen have historically proved to be vastly superior than top-down systems where wise men decide where to go. The reason for that is it allows for creativity happening in, uh, at multiple levels in unpredictable ways because the world cannot be predicted. So you allow all kinds of things to happen. Some succeed, some fail. And then here comes the tricky part. Some part of it will always fail. That is the whole point. If you're, if you're allowing a whole bunch of people to take all kinds of risk, risk means that some part of it is going to fail. And how an economy deals with this churn is a lot, in, in, an important part of this. 
So this is the reason we have something called the insolvency and bankruptcy code. So just because you failed is not a bad thing. You tried. You, another guy tried. His product was better or for whatever reason succeeded. Yours didn't. Your company shuts down. It doesn't make you a bad person. Failure is not a bad thing. Therefore, somebody going bankrupt does not mean he's a bad guy. In fact, he's an important part of that churning process. So till uh, 2016, we did not have a proper insolvency and bankruptcy system. So there was, uh, first of all, socially, uh, there was a lot of stigma attached to somebody going bankrupt. Okay, so we have tried to change that culturally. Secondly, we've created a process. You go bankrupt, take your company into the bankruptcy process. You leave, the company goes bankrupt. They pay whatever has to be done to the creditors. And that person can go back and set up another company and may fail again. It's okay. So this is a very different cultural change than the old system of, you know, bureaucrats deciding where the world should go and tells everybody again how, how it should pan out. This is a much more fluid, messier system as well. But to give you a uh, sort of live example of what I'm talking about, Jet Airways was the largest private uh, airline in the country. Two or three years ago, it failed, it shut down, it disappeared. Done. However, has the civil aviation sector in India become worse? No. The other companies expanded out very quickly. Uh, new new airlines like Casa, etc. have come in. Vistara has become big. Meanwhile, we have also privatized Air India. So this sector is continuously churning. But your experience as a user of civil aviation, uh, I'm assuming has continued to be good or probably even improved. So you can see a system that is churning, messy as it may look for individual parts, the system as a whole actually is healthier as a result of allowing uh, these failed companies to keep dying out and new ones to come. Now, this system, by the way, is a system that was pioneered to some extent by uh, uh, the US. The US is the result of oh, this kind of capitalism. But there is one sector, interestingly, where they don't allow this churn to happen. And that happens to be, interestingly, their internal civil aviation market. It's aviation. The aviation. So the, the airlines industry, in, uh, the in domestic airlines industry of the US, is ironically not a sector where this creative destruction happens, even though they, they claim to allow it as a general principle. Now, the result of this is for all to see. You, if any of you have ever been to the US, you will find that they have terrible domestic airlines. I mean, they are really pathetic. I mean, even the worst Indian airline uh, is better than their best. Why does this happen? Because they don't allow this creative destruction thing to happen. Mm. Whereas we are allowing this creative destruction to happen. Good guys are coming, bad guys are going. This is, you know, and every time somebody goes bust, you will hear, oh my God, so many jobs went. Yes, at that point in time, it is hard. And that's why there is a temptation to try and go back to some sort of a top-down uh, uh, control model. But except under extreme circumstances, you should allow this to happen. To break away a little bit, it's the honor of my life to get to learn from people like you. And, uh, you know, I'm sure the audience is feeling the same right now. So the depth to which we've reached the podcast, let's continue here. So okay. Talk at like this level. Okay. Um, and I'm going to ask you very silly questions, which I hear at house parties. Okay. I think I represent that audience. It's Go for it. All right. Uh, lots of startups hmm. want to incorporate in Singapore and Dubai rather than incorporating you. Because a lot of them eventually, like the entrepreneurs want to sell off the startups to bigger companies. And usually you have to pay a lot of tax when you sell off your startup if it's incorporated in India. So it's a very active conversation in the entire startup ecosystem of India. Yeah. I'm sure the government is aware of this. Absolutely. Uh, specifically for the world of startups, what's up? And, and uh, a startup I run, it's a meditation app. We're a part of uh, uh, the whole startup India thing. And, and it's, it's been extremely helpful. And I highly recommend founders to look into uh, what the government is doing. But I'll actually let you shed some light. So first of all, the business of uh, startups wanting to sell out is a perfectly fine thing. I mean, that's part of the, the creative destruction I talked about. Uh, yeah. This is perfectly fine. The question is, your point is, why do Indian startups need to go abroad to do it? They should be able to do it here. That's yeah. your main point. Yeah. And we absolutely agree, we should be able to do it here. We keep trying to fix things along the way. Uh, this is a bit of a race, to be fair. And sure. uh, so you have to understand Singapore, Dubai, etc. are competing with us. They're formidable com uh, competitors. So uh, so when <clears throat> we get to some stage, they have moved on and so on. So 
but we need to get our act together i'm not denying the fact that we this is a game that uh the whether it's the tax officials or the officials who are looking at uh, in mca on uh, regulations etc uh you know we have dramatically improved from where we used to be uh but you know we get feedback all the time and we we will we will we, we are also competitors don't worry we we will compete <laughs> <laughs> okay cool uh you know that thing we spoke about uh how either you to rely on your natural resources and you said no no that's not how your thinking should be yeah i'd like for you to shed some more light on that keeping in mind this whole lithium ore that's been found in kashmir and i think gold was found in orissa if i'm not mistaken so so, so you're absolutely right yeah. that natural resources are important and yes in some stage level we are ourselves using them i mean whether it's the water soil uh, minerals and so on however i would like to point out that if your entire economy particularly if you are a large population etc is entirely based on a natural resource uh, several problems occur out of this first of all um countries that have you know uh, one natural resource say oil uh, historically have not become very developed countries they can rich countries but not developed countries for example uh, so for example uh, you can have a country like kuwait uh, rich but then becomes unidimensional you see you have one resource you don't have to work very hard at it and what happens is their entire society then becomes uh, um, uh sort of inured to not having to work too hard and unless you're using this uh, resource to try and uh, build your skills etc for a time beyond oil uh, there is a big danger and by the way uh, in kuwait this is a big debate um uh, this is also true in saudi arabia and uae and by the way the rulers of those countries are fully aware of this issue so look at what say for example the uae is doing um uh, dubai interestingly is uh, one of the emirates out of the united emirates which actually doesn't have very much oil most of the oil is in the others particularly in abu dhabi so what did dubai do they actually went out and tried to cr- uh, create a f- uh, f- sort of a urban hub um, uh, uh, for business for trade for finance and so on so interestingly uh they had no resources but they interestingly if we go past oil you know and one po- point let's say we all go solar or whatever it is there will be a time when we go past oil uh interestingly the dubai is the likeliest person to survive out of that uh shift mm. because they have built capacities and other things mm. so it is very important that you know you don't get stuck with one thing um that does not mean that we don't want to find natural resources i mean lithium is important because we want to move into the next stage we need a lot of storage lithium is a important thing uh, for storage you don't want to be uh, dependent on say china or some other country for it so this is important but again i come to the point is uh, a healthy uh, forest is one where there is a tiger but there is also trees there is also deer there is also porcupines so uh similarly a uh, healthy india is one where there needs to be services there needs to be industry there needs to be mining there needs to be construction activity there needs to be farming and so on and so forth so it's the mix and the continuous evolution of that mix uh, that's uh, that's the game correct me if i'm wrong but say the moment a natural resource is found an economist like you would say okay great we got this natural resource let's use it but then we have to fuel the rest of the general wide scale development yes. that's happening so it's not like oh the natural resource is found we're rich baby no it's, not it's absolutely not in fact that's very dangerous mm, okay. because first of all you are use, it's a one time especially if you're dealing with mining mm. there's some natural resources that may be renewable okay but mining for example is a one time use you dig it up it comes out it's the end of that yeah. so um you know so you got to understand that you are using up a resource which may be a perfectly reasonable thing to do oh. but do understand that future generations now do not have use of that resource because you used it up so use it but try and value add on top of it i'm going to say something slightly controversial please correct me if you disagree okay mm. uh you know the general narrative all over the world is that india's actual greatest resource is its youth the reason i disagree is because i feel india's actual greatest resource is widespread internet so and- i i i think i'm again trying to break you away from this idea of silos okay okay uh, internet without the youth is useless the youth without the internet is also useless so don't as i keep coming back to this idea of an ecological view of an evolving ecological system that all of these things feed into each other so the internet is absolutely critical 
but it is a critical because it is able to uh, uh, mobilize the uh, the youth in multiple ways um, you know whether they are getting information or they are providing information in it's both goes both ways mm. um, so i think the key here is to understand that uh, each one of these things is uh, important only to the extent that it is feeding the wider system any one of these things in its isolation is uh, won't take you very far okay it's like 11 players in a cricket team you need to have a fast bowler a spin bowler absolutely okay. you, they, and how how they play as a team in fact cricket still allows for outstanding individual performance uh, let's say uh, if you take football or hockey or something there uh, it is uh, more difficult to you know one outstanding player to uh, you know uh, Uh, to adjust for everybody else. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Um. I'm just trying to dig out. Yeah. Crystal clear information yeah, here, which is enough. why I want you to constantly yeah, connect yeah, me. Yeah. No problem. Uh. Also, this is our first economics based <laughs> podcast. Okay. So. Uh. Anyway. Um. Uh, I'm asking you the questions based on all the geopolitical guests we've had. Yeah. Have you heard of two gentlemen, Abhijit Chawla and Rajiv Malhotra? Uh. I know. Uh. I know the second. I cannot. I don't know much about the first. Both these are internet. I know the name, but I don't know much about them. All right. Yeah. the both polywats both are from kind of the world of engineering and science uh both are very very well versed with history uh and now they're both geopolitical observers and especially on the show but generally on the internet i've not seen uh people with this much clout for the sake of their opinions for example okay. there's lots of people who express their opinions on the internet these two gentlemen get respected every time we bring them on yeah, the show yeah fair enough so uh Does the government track minds like these on the internet and say that okay, you know, maybe these guys would kind of be useful to us in some capacity? So there is a large number of people who we take feedback from, and sometimes directly from them, sometimes indirectly from them. So you have to understand again, uh, somebody like me inhabits a uh, an ocean of intellectual activity, and uh, you know, we are feeding on this all the time. Right. some of it may be directly by virtue of engaging them in a conversation one to one or putting bringing them on to a project uh and in other other places it happens more diffused you know i may read their paper book etc so yes so you know i can tell you for sure both yeah. these guys yeah. are aggressively hungry to be a part of uh so i'm sure the they see uh, they, they, uh, yeah so i mean i as i said i uh, i know rajiv malhotra i've not read his latest books but i have in the past engaged uh, uh, So interacted with him. Okay. Uh, so I have some general idea of his views. We had him on the show yeah. two weeks ago, where mm-hmm. he said that uh, AI is here. He's an artificial intelligence engineer, like okay. that's his actual profession. Sure. Uh, and he said that where AI is at, I'm sure you've kept up with what's happening with Chat GPT and all that. Uh, it's going to change multiple industries. I see it changing tech. Like coders are using it to improve their code. Content creators are using it to improve content. and this is just level 1 it's going to keep going deeper uh the thing is these are american companies and america owns the algorithms parallelly have you watched the social dilemma it's a netflix documentary about yeah, how yeah and I, yeah i have watched it and i'm sure the government also thinks about algorithms and these kind of absolutely things. i also i, I mean, tweet about this stuff all the time yeah, i'd love i'd love for you to shed some light on what your view on this algorithm problem is okay and i'll i'll tell you why two reasons one i feel algorithms intensely govern human emotion in the modern day and human opinions and the second reason is rajiv so spoke about how uh it will govern even geopolitical narratives and it's a massive geopolitical weapon so when you're using chat gpt it's actually american it's a fantastic tool it'll help you in your profession it'll make you more money but at the end of the day you're strengthening an american algorithm and ideally there should have been indian algorithms doing the same thing i've also spoken to some ai engineers who claim that there is talent available in india but nobody knows why indians have not been able to build something like a chat gpt by this point so many things are going on in india by the way ai is also being done in india many of these american countries are developing uh, these things in india as well so there's all kinds of things going on so it's not like there is a uh, box and this is happening it's a messy world with all kinds of uh, inflows and outflows and influences going on now is it the case that algorithms are Uh, uh uh are something we should pay attention to so first of all let me be clear what is an algorithm basically al- an algorithm is uh, uh an equation or set of equations which allows for certain patterns to be uh play out okay so this is what it is so that the audience is clear now 
in this particular uh, space, one of the dangers here is, there are many, one of the dangers here is that people assume that because there are a set of equations, they are somehow objective truths, right? Now, the, the problem is that an algorithm can be set up to or may end up actually uh, getting swayed in a particular direction because um, uh, and be influenced by much more subjective things. But so, for example, uh, I'll take something that people are already familiar with. People all go there and uh, use Wikipedia. You know, everybody wants basic information on something, they go to Wikipedia. Now, what happens is, in fact, Wikipedia is edited by a group of editors. Okay? And over time, a hierarchy of editors has been created who are ideologically tilted in a particular way. Mm -hmm. You had Vikram Sampath on your show. I am there. Uh, our Wikipedia entries are continuously tampered with. Okay. So, all viewers in there, you know, uh, my Wikipedia entry is, uh, you know, not exactly, it's tilted in a particular way, deliberately. Now, this is obvious, right? If somebody investigates and goes to the history, they can see that, you know, there are uh, systematically a bunch of people who are messing with it. In an algorithm, this is not very clear. And people who are doing chat GPT and they may ask a question about uh, something, they will get a certain answer and the impression they will get is that this is, you know, objective truths. But in fact, it's not objective truths. The algorithm has either been already swayed in a particular direction or has, uh, over time, uh, been trained or even externally nudged in a particular direction. Uh, so uh, the, the chances of uh, manipulation are not trivial. Mm. And this is why, and then what happens because there's so much of this going on and it's getting infected every aspect of life uh, that in fact, this just kind of spreads and spreads. And then your reality is driven by this somewhat managed uh, algorithm that uh, is being used to manipulate you. I, I'm, I'm not sure what these two gentlemen are afraid of, but I'm assuming it, that is roughly what they are talking about. Mm. And we are fully aware of this. Uh, but, you know, we can't be afraid of this problem. We have to engage with yeah. it. I mean, there's two aspects. Mm. One is what you're saying, where mm. people create bubbles around themselves, mm. echo chambers. Yes. Where even, you know, sometimes then your human relationships also get uh, affected because of your political Absolutely. views. So say someone who's extremely anti-Modi will surround themselves with anti-Modi yeah. So this is only an ideological field. It can happen with many other things as well. Mm. Yeah. It can be, for yeah. example, uh, technology frameworks. Yeah. Or, uh, or any, anything. An opinion on a football player. Yeah. You'll, you'll no, but these are opinions. But yeah. they can be also uh, things which have, for example, you can sway, for example, does a particular kind of vaccine work or not? Mm. And that has enormous implications about what kind of vaccine becomes the standard. Right. You know, so all kinds of games are played. Geopolitics can be played like this. That's the other angle that they're speaking about. Yeah. Uh, they said that because ChatGPT is incorporated in America, eventually it is going to get powerful enough for the American government to also have a say in how that algorithm is developing in the future. Parallelly, China has been developing these algorithms for a while. Now, this sounds so silly, right? We just say, oh, they've been developing these algorithms. But I'm specifically talking about AI bots here. Uh, China so it's not the case that we don't have capability of doing AI bots and yeah. we have in various areas using AI bots. Okay. The question is, let's be also clear that at the, as things stand, the US is in a position to impose on large parts of the world the standard. Right. Like for, I'll give you one example. Let's take Twitter for example. We have also tried creating Ku, etc. And they work in local languages, etc. But at this juncture, Twitter cannot be created easy, recreated easily by, say, an in India. Because <clears throat> you need everybody to be in the same place for Twitter to work. I also need the, uh, Trump to be there. I also need Biden to be there. I want uh, uh, Rishi Sunak to be there. I want uh, the Japanese, Australian uh, prime ministers to be there. I want their movie stars to be there. I want their football players to be there. I want their business and at this juncture, it's much more unlikely, it's not impossible, it's unlikely that something done by an Indian company will take over that space when there is a clustering effect that happens from global uh, acceptance. So, same thing with Wikipedia. You can complain, I complain all the time about Wikipedia, 
But the fact of the matter is, it is what it is. And knowing it, despite knowing its biases, I'm also a user of Wikipedia. If I want a quick information on, you know, a place or some scientific term, you know, that's where I go to even myself. Right. Uh, knowing that it may not be exactly the true, but mota mota, I'll get an idea mm. what the whole thing is about. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, there are segments where we may have the clout to do it, but we cannot say that, oh, we will do what China is doing, is close ourselves out. First of all, our political system is not set up for doing that. Secondly, in the long run... You mean, it, you mean like a... Closed Fire world, closed yeah. world okay. system. So first of all, we are not set up to do that. And since we are not set up to do that, uh, it means that our uh, population, our youth in particular, will go and use anything that is the, which is creating rapidly clustering in its own right. We may be able to do it in segments. You know, say, uh, creating an AI bot to answer questions on the GST system. Mm. Now, I have a closed system there. I may be able to... Oh. But a general open system like ChatGPT, so far, right now, we don't have. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be aware of the risk and that we should not be uh, pushing back in multiple ways to this. Uh, so I'll give you another example where it is not algorithms. So algorithms at least is happening here. There is much more subtle ways in which this is done. So for example, there is something called ESG. You know what this ESG is? So let me explain. ESG is environmental, social, and governance norms. Now, this is something that globally, but particularly Western governments are pushing to make this a part of all kinds of decision-making. So supposing there is a, a fund that is going to invest or a large company that is going to invest, they are supposed to take care of something called these three years, the environment, social, and governance norms to take decisions. So, okay. Now, <clears throat> sounds like a good thing to do. We should all agree. Environment, social, governance, things are good things to do. Now, what happens, however, is these are actually subjective things. Okay, mm. what is good for social society is there's no objective uh, thing. There, at, at least at the margin, a lot of it is uh, basically Sub somebody's opinion. Yep. So what now we will do is we will now uh, create a bunch of people who will impose on you uh, what those norms are. So I, so let's say I accept that those norms are good. Then, you know, a, a, a ESG rating a company will pop up somewhere and then it will deconstruct you and tell you, Ki, this is what you should be doing. Hmm. And now because I'm stuck with this being, I've accepted this framework, I will have to take decisions in a particular way. So this is a well-established system already, but is, uh, you know, you have uh, uh, think tanks in the West, uh, like, for example, uh, VDEM in Sweden or Freedom House in the US or uh, Chatham House in London, they are in this business of creating global narratives. So you and I may think that certain thing is actually uh, gospel truth, but in fact, it has been put inside our head. And these things can be quite powerful. Um, and so, for example, we recently had VDEM came out with a, a, a list of uh, great democracies in the world, okay? Uh, it's of 140 count countries. Now, we are the world's largest democracy. We are rated 108. Mm. Okay. Just above Pakistan, by the way. Mm. <laughs> okay. There is a list also, some of these guys have done, of academic freedom. Okay. And in that list, we are rated below Afghanistan. Mm. I mean, how? Who does these things? But you see, if it is not managed, if you are not paying attention, what happens is that you may not know that this index even exists. But that index goes into another index, which goes into this ESG norm. And then your life is being run by these mm. uh, indices. And this is happening very systematically. And I have written very, uh, I've been writing about this for a while. We need to pay attention to it. And now what will happen is that you have now, let's say an AI chat, chat GPT or something that gets trained to feed on this. Mm. So let's say in a few years, you could, you could actually type out, is India a democracy? And Chad GPT has been trained to go and look at these specific uh, places and come out, no, India is not a democracy. Even though blatantly you can see that it's a democracy, but Chad GPT will tell you that it is not. Because you will then create a an, an completely alternative uh, uh, reality based on these things. Yep. So, and uh, so this is why I, th I think this is something we need to be very careful about, create debate about it and push back. Because if you don't do this actively, you will be deconstructed and told what to do. It's a form of new colonization. 
Yeah, exactly. This is what uh, they said. Parley to break away. I just want to say that you know how in school you have a crush on a girl for the first time. Uh, sometimes you have a crush on a guy. It's a man crush. It's not a sexual crush right. or a romantic crush. And sometimes you just have a crush on someone's mind. I currently just developed a crush on your <laughs> mind. <laughs> this is this is a very widespread kind of uh, opinion that you've given, and this is what's missing from the internet today. And this is exactly why podcasts are growing because you get to explain things in this nuanced manner. So I have been very much engaged with this debate for some years, oh. and even in things which may seem like <clears throat> this is uh, completely objective, somebody you know, the ILO has gone and done this uh, study, or WHO know what they are doing, but a lot of it this is just garbage. Mm. They made it up because they want to manipulate you in some way, and many of these international organizations deliberately do this. And I've just published a working paper uh, just last week, uh, which says reversing the gaze. Why reversing the gaze? So all these go, uh, these international agencies love to tell us what to do. Mm. So I have reversed the gaze and looked at what their data methodologies systems are. Mm. And I'm sorry to say, much of it is garbage. Mm. And, uh, and they have like almost kindergarten level mistakes in many of them. So, you know, so at the start of the podcast, we spoke about the critics of the government. Um, I think it is important for any government to be criticized to a certain degree. Absolutely. But it becomes messy when the critics of the government refer to only the West and take these studies and then use it as gospel in order to criticize the government. Yes. And by the way, there there are mistakes in our system, the data systems also. But there is clearly a tilt in a particular direction. See, if I, that there are mistakes in the world is not new. Mm. But if they were all mistakes which are scattered around, some are good, some are bad, that kind of thing. That's not the case. In all the investigations that I'm doing, the, the mistakes are always to the to the negative side. The problem is always getting exaggerated rather than uh, uh, minimized. Then you begin to develop a somewhat of a suspicion that mm. uh, this jelly is jelly of some sort. Mm. I mean, ye, in fact, in many areas, it's not kala in it's kali dal. dal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. In order to explain this point a little deeper, how does the Indian government look at this whole George Soros situation? And uh, also you spoke about how some of these situations are, uh, you effectively said that it's kind of geopolitically governed. Absolutely. Okay. So there are powerful countries or powerful governments out there? Powerful interests. Because they, sometimes those interests may be at loggerheads with their own government. <laughs> so you- for example, like you mentioned George Soros. George Soros is a billionaire. I think he's an American citizen of Hungarian origin. Uh, He has historically uh, used his billions of dollars to essentially affect certain kinds of narratives in the world and also affect, you know, changes in government and all these kinds of things he pushes for. Now, you you know, as a country that's been colonized repeatedly and for hundreds of years, we have a right to be suspicious about all of this. And when he comes on television and says that, you know, India, you know, is wrong. I'm going to put a billion dollars behind trying to. We need to be extremely careful about this because it is effectively somebody threatening our um, yeah, threatening uh, um, uh, regime change in our country, mm. right? And uh, especially given known histories, uh, you know, he has in the past caused a lot of economic uh, damage in the world, um, and he's open about it. Uh, he is himself, by the way, he claims that he is uh, in this uh, in this because he's promoting uh, open societies, democracy, etc. Because uh, he um, uh, experienced the um, uh, Jew- Jew- Jewish Holocaust personally. But in fact, his own history is quite suspect. He was 14, 15 years old. And he survived the uh, Holocaust himself by essentially turning into an informer. Uh, so, and he's, he... he uh, he, he is admitted to this on television. So, you know, let's be very careful about it. He was, he was no heroic Auschwitz survivor. He was an informer. And then he escapes to the US, becomes a very wealthy uh, investor. And then he uses this resources to carry out things which he believes is true. He may genuinely believe these are, uh, uh, th- that he's doing good. That I don't, I know, it's quite possible that he really thinks he's doing good. But the fact of the matter is, that is the point about democracy. Why should a person who is not even in the country have the right to tell us what is or isn't correct and use enormous resources then to sway us in a particular way? 
uh, as Indians, forget whether I'm in the government or you like or dislike the current government. This is an extremely dangerous thing which we must resist. Mm. Okay, first of all, Sanjeev sir, you've given me too much to think about. You've taught me a lot over this episode. Thank you. Uh, Pleasure. Yeah, there's there's too much more to kind of mine out of your head. Uh, I feel that you're one of those people who needs to be asked the right questions and then like the nectar comes out. Uh, I want to ask you so much more, but because we have a bit of a shortage of time, the one question I saved for the end was that as someone who's working with the government now, what are you thinking about in the near future in terms of reforms? I think you highlighted infrastructure in this conversation, that that's what PM Modi is uh, really passionate about. But I'm, you know how we spoke about objectivity and subjectivity? Mm -hmm. I feel often even in positions of leadership, there is a certain amount of subjectivity and subjectivity can be positive. For example, if someone feels very intensely about one cause, they'll put more focus, energy, power into that. Keeping all these aspects in mind, What's going to happen in the next five to 10 years for India? Okay. And I've, I've asked a lot of people this question. <laughs> I feel you're the right person to ask. So next, uh, in the zero to five year horizon, I think we are very clear. We're going to build out world-class infrastructure. Okay. So we are here in Mumbai. Just look around you. This now, by the way, has the largest concentration of cranes anywhere on the planet. More mm. than Shanghai, Beijing, or other places people tell you about. Largest concentration of cranes in the world right now, Mumbai. and you can see it. Just go to a tall building. Just look at the amount of construction that's happening. We are building a massive metro system all in one shot. Uh, I think the, the radial line that goes from Kulaba to uh, our Kaf Parade all the way to Seeps, uh, that on day one is going to be one of the most crowded metro lines in the world. Um, similarly, we're building the coastal road at the same time. We are connecting through to the mainland through the um, uh, harbor link. There is a brand new airport coming out on the other end, which will be significantly larger than the existing one. So imagine the amount of infrastructure, and this is just Mumbai. And, you know, in Delhi also, we're building a massive new airport, and other things are going happening all the country. So build out world-class infrastructure. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the first thing that we are doing, and, 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 and that's already in the way. This, but if you're taking the five to 10-year horizon, there are a bunch of things we need to do. The top in my list, other people may have other lists, I'll tell you my list. Top in that list has got to be, we've got to fix our legal system. Uh, you may be aware, every family, everybody who's listening here, somewhere in your family, extended uh, family, there'll be a case that's stuck there forever and ever and ever. Tariq pe tariq. Tariq pe tariq. Now, this has got to be ridiculous. Mm. You can't have a legal system like this. Mm. If you want a modern economy, you want delivery of justice, you want enforcement of contracts, this is ludicrous. We've got to fix this. So in my top of list of things we need to solve in a decade uh, horizon is got to be this. And it will take many uh, steps. Uh, there will be friction between the judiciary and the government over different ideas of what needs to be done, etc. But we not, we've got to get on and do this. This, is, this cannot be delayed. The second thing we need to, uh, big thing we need to do is to fix our uh, bureaucracy and administrative system. So, <clears throat> The bureaucracy and administrative system is a lot better than it used to be 20 years ago. But still, the, you have to understand that the origins of this system and the way the architecture of the system is set up is set up for something else. So where did our bureaucracy and administrative system come from? It came from the colonial period. What did they want to do? Their main job was really controlling the population. There were a tiny number of uh, British uh, administrators and their job was to make sure that they controlled the system as far as they could uh, and uh, that was the main thing. Now, independence happens. Now, the agenda should sh now shift to development, growth, etc. But we decide to do this. Uh, we decide to become a socialist economy. And remember, I told you in the beginning about all those wise people sitting in planning commission. Well, how do you make sure that everybody does all the things those wise men want to do? Well, therefore, you have in the socialist system, you have to perpetuate these controls. So you created license, permit, Raj. Licenses have to be given. I'll give you a license, you do this. Yeah, I'll give you a permit, you do this. And so that architecture of licenses and permits meant that this bureaucracy continued to basically have a mindset of control. Now, 1991 happens. Suddenly, the bureaucracy it has all these powers taken away from it. And over time, over the last 30 years, these powers are slowly, slowly whittled away. So just a few years ago, you wanted some passport or anything, you had to go to a gazetted officer to get some signature. Why do you need to go to this gazetted officer? 
again idea of control mm. now what has happened is that in the last 30 years all the progress has happened by essentially withdrawing these powers from the uh, bureaucracy but it has not been done by reforming the bureaucracy the bureaucracy even today is set up for control it just has fewer things it's allowed to control so it's withdrawn its powers but it has not improved the bureaucracy itself now we need to improve the bureaucracy to do the things it should do so far we are stopping it from doing the things it shouldn't do now we should get it design it to do the things it should do which are which are you know delivery of municipal services for example right <clears throat> bureaucracy should be focused on uh, getting your roads making sure your water supply comes on time these kinds of issues uh, get making sure the health system works make sure the, the government schools uh, the teachers turn up on time and so all those things that requires a service uh, uh, system not a instead of a control mindset you need a service mindset now that requires redesigning the administrative system itself there's no point in blaming an individual here that's not the problem we always keep oh if only the ias officer ips officer was better trained it will lead to a solution no it will not lead to a solution because the tools he's given the in the universe in which he or she functions is set up for doing something else there's no point in blaming the individual uh, bureaucrat blame the system yeah you have to change the system now and there are remarkable people who are still doing great things inside this system and by the way also in the judiciary there are people who are delivering great things but there's no point in asking an individual judge because the system itself is set up in a bizarre way and uh, very often you know this whole system of uh, you simply allowed to appeal at every stage against whoever so even if a judge gives a great judgment you can appeal against it so this is go on forever so the system in both judiciary and administration now needs to be changed uh, i think this whole thing was set up in the 19th century we are now well into the 21st century we now need to create a system for the 21st century okay uh come back on the show soon sir <laughs> <laughs> that's all i want to say wow like blown away by this conversation blown away by just the bank of knowledge uh and i'm feeling a sense of confidence as an indian that there's guys like you in the government like who are running the show because thank you it was a pleasure being here yeah and it was good fun as well <laughs> no i'm i'm glad sir uh again the perfectionist in me feels like i've not done justice to this conversation but that but maybe next time we'll talk about beer and biceps <laughs> <laughs> leaves leaves room for another few chats i just hope you had fun i, I hope had fun. that uh, this turned out the way uh, you expected yes I, it was great fun okay and um, so as i said um, a wide ranging conversation and um, hopefully your audience likes it too yeah you know there's few podcasts that i myself have to listen to again a bunch of times in order to prepare for the second one that's exactly what i'm going to do fabulous uh thank you for coming down to the studio sir uh lots more to learn from you all i want to say is that often the youth especially but even our parents generation they have these very sharp opinions and that's fine they've that's lived fine. out life they've had their own experiences they have and that's part of being indian too yeah yeah 100% <laughs> having opinions uh but it is important to be able to change your opinion and it is important to be able to gather enough op- information in order to shape that opinion better that's what i'm trying to do through conversations like this with yourself with other people kind of from your domain so thank you for educating the internet right now the indian internet needs more conversations like this so for digital listeners do you have any last message well i hope to be back here as you promised yes um and uh, yeah we will have uh, we'll have uh, we'll discuss something else or maybe extend this conversation forward yeah honestly the balls in your court cuz i know people are going to love this kind of conversation the indian internet needs more of this super so see you here soon yeah sanjeev sir thank you uh, means a lot and looking forward to seeing you again that was the episode for today my friends honestly because of a time constraint i felt like i wasn't able to go as deep as i truly wish to go with sanjeev sir this also leaves room for my next conversation with this fine gentleman because there was so much to learn from him it's very rare that you find this kind of a polymath who's also a fantastic communicator i'm looking forward to doing many many more episodes with sanjeev sir i'm looking forward to learn from him so much more I love that at so many points in this podcast my bubble was burst thanks to his experience that's what the joy of podcasting is there's a lot of people who'll make judgments or make assumptions about youtubers and podcasters 
But what I like about our community is that we're all growing together, me included. This is an episode I felt like I grew in terms of knowledge. This was a very new subject for me. And I'm glad I got to learn with you folks. So tell me guys, one, how can I improve these conversations with intellectuals like this? Uh, my challenge is that I can't make it too deep because then it becomes too intense for younger audiences. And I can't make it too shallow because then it's not a fun conversation. So keeping that in mind, please give me your feedback. Also tell me who else you'd like to see on TRS. Also tell me that you're going to go and download my meditation app level on the App Store, on the Play Store. Also tell me how you're going to go follow us on Spotify. Because every episode is available on Spotify 48 hours before it's available anywhere else in the world. TRS will be back soon. Ranveer will be back soon. Sanjeev sir will be back soon. And the Sone Ki Chidiya Din will be back soon. We'll see you later. We're part of the change. Keep supporting TRS. Lots of love to you guys. Thank you.